Good morning, everyone. We're grateful for the opportunity to gather together online for worship today. My name is Josh. I want to welcome you to the prelude. The prelude is a brief segment right before Metro's worship service where we're able to gather virtually just to prepare ourselves as we enter into worship together as a community. And so we're grateful and thankful that you've decided to come worship with us today. Please take the opportunity if you're new or if you're visiting to text the word Metro to 94,000. We'll be able to send out a brief survey to you just to share more information about our church and find ways that you can really plug into the life of our community. And so we also encourage you to share this post and, and invite others that you know or you might know would be interested in joining us for worship today. We have seen a tremendous uh, just response to our online worship. And we're grateful that we're able to do this wherever you might be. Um, and as we enter into worship together, uh, we want to be able to just settle down our hearts. We know that there's a lot of busyness happening in our lives and in our world. Um, and yet we're able to be uh, really given this time to uh, reflect on God's goodness and faithfulness to us as a church. And so as we enter into worship together, uh, will you please join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together as a church, uh, to be able to lift your name in praise, to be able to hear your word, uh, to be able to confess together, um, Lord, just the many ways that we fall short from your will, uh, the many ways that we neglect uh, your goodness and faithfulness to us. Will you recenter us and reorient us in this moment here and now, and to be able to just take in a greater sense of your presence uh, and to be able to delight in all that you have done through your son, Jesus, uh, and be able to, um, Lord, just be joyful and knowing that you are a good God and Lord, you are worthy and, and trustworthy and dependable um, no matter what we're experiencing in our life today. And so Lord, we thank you, we praise you, in your son's mighty name we pray, amen. Thank you. 
It's always glad uh, to just worship uh, together with you today. Today's call to worship comes from John chapter 15, verses 9 to 11. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may may be complete. A lot of us friends are coming in today, not even just a week after Easter, and we're experiencing the crash of just daily living. We're stuck in guilt, temptations, and just feeling powerless in our lives. But don't forget this, because Jesus rose from the dead, his power lives in us. His joy is in us. And so we can come to worship not uh, just hindered by our failures and our weaknesses, but rather we can boast in them, standing firmly in the power of the resurrection. And so how do we respond? We leave this place transformed by grace, by the power of the victory we have in Jesus. So would you celebrate with us today that Christ's joy is in us and that our joy may be complete. Let's sing together. And how I long to breathe the air of heaven, where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets, to look upon the one who led to save me and walk with him for all. Stand in 
us towards transformative change. Father, I pray that this melts our hearts into repentance this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we're going to dismiss our children and our toddlers uh, to the third floor for their Crossroad Sunday School program. So if you're a parent, uh, please feel free to bring your children to the back of the worship hall, um, to the volunteers. Uh, in their blue shirts who can uh, walk the children up to continue on in their worship program. Uh, many of us, you know, without even thinking twice, uh, so easily call Jesus Savior and Lord of our lives. But we're so prone, if we're honest, to rejecting Jesus' Lordship in favor of so many other things, so many other priorities. Um, that have functionally become the Lord of our lives. And so what an amazing thing that God, in all his grace, he gives us an opportunity to confess all the different ways that we've sinned against him, not as a way for us to make up for all the ways that we failed, not as a way to punish us or beat us up because we haven't gone the way that we've, uh, that we've been supposed to, but purely because the fact that the work has been finished. Jesus completed the work on the cross. He died, rose again, defeated death once and for all, paid the price of sin so that we now have the opportunity uh, to confess in a way where our confessions aren't things that weigh us down, but they're things that actually link us to the finished work that Jesus has completed on our behalf. And so we can do this uh, two ways here. We do this first corporately or generally through a prayer of confession that we recite together. And the words of that prayer um, will help to feed a personal confession where we go to God privately, uh, where we can be more specific about our sin uh, and just uh, spend some time in private prayer uh, and intimate confession to him alone. And so let's take this opportunity as one body to confess together as we recite the prayer on the screen in one voice. O oh Lord, as long as I am apart from you, I am self-satisfied because I have no standard by which to measure my low stature. But when I come near to you, there, for the first time, I see myself. In your light, I behold my darkness. In your purity, I behold my corruption. My very confession of sin is the fruit of holiness. O oh Jesus, let me gaze on you more and more until, in the vision of your brightness, I loathe the sight of my impurity until in the blaze of that glory, which human eye has not seen, I fall prostrate, blinded, broken, to rise again a new man in you. Amen. Friends, let's just take a moment to just be honest with our Father. Let's let our confessions be a springboard to his forgiveness, to the peace, and uh, you know, just the, the relationship that he offers us. So let's go to him now in private confession.
word of encouragement this morning comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's let the truth of these words cut through the busyness and the, the mindlessness that so often and so easily overtake our lives. Jesus has been raised, and he's in the highest place. That means that he is supreme. He reigns supreme above every circumstance, above every worry, above every failure. And so it's through his power that we have the ability to break away and break free from all these other things that vie for lordship in our lives uh, and instead declare that he alone is supreme, he alone is Lord of all. And so this means that we can really live the way that we were designed to be with Jesus as Lord instead of created things as Lord. And, you know, if you look, uh, as we heard in our call to worship today, um, the more that we abide in Jesus, the more that we become like Jesus, shaped by Jesus into our natural order, uh, the more that we will actually be made complete in our joy and we'll become more like him and more satisfied in that. And so you look at Christ uh, and, and just at the core of who he is, he is uh, a God who gives. He's a God who pours out. He doesn't uh, demand from his people. He doesn't profit off of his people. In fact, he disperses all the wealth that he has so that we can be filled up. And so in response to that, uh, we can actually participate as a spiritual act of worship in our tithes and our offerings, just being able to give radically, declaring that it's not by hoarding up wealth, by hoarding up riches, that we're going to become more joyful, more whole, more complete, more satisfied, but actually by becoming more like Christ and giving this away, trusting that there is better uh, riches that he offers us. And so if you're new or visiting, please don't feel obligated to... Um, to give. We're just glad that you have chosen to come and spend your Sunday morning with us. Uh, we just want to invite you, if you haven't yet had a chance, please consider texting the word METRO to 94000 just to let us know that you're here and start getting connected in your journey here with us at METRO. But if you are someone who uh, feels like you're just being shaped, brought to new life, uh, really challenged and, and uh, finding new life in the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want to invite you, please consider uh, just this call uh, to give, and you can respond to it by going to our website, metrophilia.org slash give. Uh, there are different ways that you can give online there. So let's just take some time now uh, to give of our tithes and offerings. Uh, also want to just give a quick reminder of our advanced campaign, which is continuing to uh, roll along. This is just a separate uh, fund in addition to our normal tithes and offerings where we're asking if you uh, just you know feel led to please consider contributing to that fund separately uh, for our new building, for just a lot of different ways uh, that we are in need to really continue to enhance the ministry that we do here in this city. Uh, if you want more information about that, you can go to our website, metrophilia.org slash advance. Uh, there's a ton of information there uh, where you can commit as well. So let's just take this time and give of our tithes and offerings. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that, Lord, you took the initiative to draw close to us, Lord, as your people, Father, um, that you saw us, Lord, in our brokenness, just in our state where we have made so many other things, Lord, created things, things that weren't designed to be, Lord, uh, and really placed them above you, Father. And yet, uh, you took mercy on us, Father, and you sent your Son, uh, really to intervene, Lord, in our lives and uh, to set us on a right path, Lord, through his work, through his person. Uh, Lord, uh, help us to respond to that, Lord, uh, just in gratitude. Help us to respond uh, in a way where, Lord, as we give, we could actually become more confident. We could become more satisfied through Christ, uh, trusting that, Lord, in him we are ultimately rich, Father, and we are ultimately made complete. 
Uh, Lord, we want to also lift up our city to you. Um, and Father, just day after day, um, Lord, we read the news. Uh, Lord, for those of us who go into the city, Lord, on a daily basis, we see firsthand just the brokenness uh, of our city, Lord, in ways that uh, don't even make the news sometimes, Lord, uh, and just kind of go unseen. Uh, Lord, we pray for all those things, Lord. We also pray for just the systemic injustices, Lord. We pray for the systemic brokenness uh, that resides within our city, Lord. Um, Father, in the ways that we can, we pray that you would soften our hearts to really go out and serve, uh, Lord, just the underserved, to really be present, Father, to have a heart of compassion and service and uh, really desiring to pour out on behalf of those who are so easily forgotten and overlooked, Lord, um, just as Christ did for us, uh, Lord. But, Lord, in all these things, I pray that you would never help us, uh, help us to never lose hope. Lord, uh, that you are sovereign, Lord, that you are Lord of all, and that, Lord, it's not even just despite the brokenness, but that you are a God who chooses intentionally to work through the brokenness, Lord, uh, within our church, within our lives, within our city. Um, help us to, Lord, just take faith that you will come and make all things right again, Lord, one day as you have promised. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I just want to pause for a minute uh, and welcome you. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the leaders here at Metro, um, and I want to just uh, welcome you to Metro. Thank you for joining us today for our 1130 service. Um, if you're new, if you're visiting, um, you know, it's a great time to be new, a uh, great season to be new, because we just launched a new season of community groups at our church, and it's really the best way, I think, our weekly community groups, just to start to get to know the people of our church. Um, I know it's really crazy sometimes on a Sunday service, um, just to, you know, just to really have substantial and meaningful conversations because there's so much going on and people are just kind of in and out. So we want to invite you, please consider checking out one of our community groups. There's 18 of them all throughout the greater Philadelphia, Pennsylvania suburbs, South Jersey areas. Um, if you're interested in visiting and just seeing what we're about there, um, you can text the word METRO to 94000 um, and, uh, and kind of kick off the process to getting to know us um, so that we can get to know you as well and really start that dialogue. Um, also, if you're visiting um, today, we have a special opportunity uh, to meet downstairs at the Welcome Center right after service. Um, right uh, in front, as soon as you come in through the front doors, just the, those tables on the side. Uh, some of our leaders and pastors will be down there uh, just to go out with you for lunch um, so that uh, it's our welcome lunch. We do this every so often. It's an opportunity just to connect, ask questions, learn more, hear from some of our pastors and leaders about who we are, uh, what we believe, uh, what our vision is really uh, just in the city, what we believe we've been called to. And, um, you know, it's your opportunity to ask questions, just have a dialogue, uh, and it's a free lunch. So uh, if you're newer uh, and you're interested in that, please just meet us downstairs right after service today. Um, also, for our Crosswalk College Fellowship, I uh, just want to announce that all of our college students are invited to our annual senior banquet. Um, so as we approach graduation um, on our East Falls campus right here on Friday, April 26th from 6.30 to 9. Uh, we're going to be celebrating our seniors, our graduating seniors. And so uh, if you want to register, metrophilly.org slash events, please just register. Let us know that you're coming there. Uh, if you have any questions at all, you can reach out to Andrew at metrophilly.org. Um, and finally, if you are a married, professed Christian couple that is not currently a part of our Couples Fellowship, uh, we want to invite you. Today is the very last day that you can register for this upcoming season of Couples Fellowship. Uh, if you have any questions at all, you can reach out to Danny at metrophilly.org. Uh, but this is just, you know, very similar to our community groups, but obviously for a very specific stage of life as married couples, um, and, and not as often, but just being able to gather every once in a while, connect with other married couples, go through content together. Uh, it, it's just really, uh, really helpful, really good opportunities to connect and to go deeper um, and to pray and to work these things out in the context of our marriages. Uh, we want to invite you to do that. You can go to metrophilly.org slash events to register. Today is the last day, so please register if you haven't already had a chance to do so. Thank you. Um, today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 24, verse 49, and Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. You may also follow along on page 8 of the bulletin. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. 
While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned in Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken, up, taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Before we go into uh, this text, I just wanted to take a moment to update you. Uh, as you know, if you've been uh, attending our church, we've been looking for a space uh, to worship uh, going forward. And um, we're in the process of praying through this. And I wanted to call this congregation here to prayer. We are, um, we are very intently looking at a space about three minutes drive from here. Uh, so it's very close by, full parking availability um, uh, and extensive parking availability. It's going to be wonderful for our congregation, <clears throat> but um, it's a, and it's a lot more space. Space is hard to come by, and it's coveted here in the city. So, um, it's a it's an opportunity that uh, that has been made available to us. It's going to be a considerable amount of financial lift for this congregation for our church. Um, and as you as as uh, our presider Kevin uh, mentioned about the advance campaign, for those of you if you are aware of the advance campaign. We just ask that you continue to stay consistent and contribute to that. Uh, we ask you to do that. If you've been blessed by this ministry in any way, if you've been shaped by this ministry, if, if you've been shaped by the gospel here as a part of this community, we call you to deepen your commitment by deepening a financial commitment as well uh, to this ministry. So please consider doing that. Just check out metrophilia.org slash advance. We'll probably provide some sort of presentation at some point. We're trying to do that at least once a quarter. But right now, what I'm going to ask you to do is just join me briefly in prayer. Uh, I'm not asking you to just pray this one time, but just keep us in prayer going forward. And I wanted to use this time as a launch pad or a springboard for us to continue to pray for this congregation. And first, for the advance of the gospel. Many of you are new here. Um, I, my prayer is that you will plug into the values of this community uh, and understand its vision, its purpose, its mission. Why are we here and why it's so necessary for us to be able to move to a new location. We're just running out of space, as you can see here, um, as the con kingdom continues to advance. And that is a, it is a rare thing for a church to grow in the capacity that we are growing at the rate that we are growing. Let's celebrate it, but not let, let rest on our laurels. Let's heed the call of Christ in continuing to advance his kingdom here uh, and what he's doing here. Secondly, let's just pray for wisdom and clarity. And lastly, let's pray for provision, that God would send people to continually to, to serve his kingdom through just giving, just your giving. Our immigrant families, that's all they could do back in the day. They didn't have opportunities to go on missions. They didn't have opportunities to do a lot of the things that we're able to do now as second and third generation immigrants. Many of you are falling in that category. 
let's take the opportunity and, and the privilege to follow after their footsteps and what they've done to continue to contribute to the kingdom. Let's do that. I call on you to do that. Let's pray for that as we, as we dive into the text. Will you just take a moment and join with me in, si- in silent prayer? I'm just going to close this briefly, and then we'll, we'll dive into the text. Lord, it's my hope and prayer that through your word and through the health of this body, Lord, that you would continue to challenge us, move us towards advancing your kingdom, uh, Lord, through the, through the work of your church, and I pray that you would give us all the, well, we don't really lose sleep, we've, we've done that in the past and it's taken us nowhere, um, Lord, we look to Jesus, we look to your provision, and so will you provide us with the wisdom and clarity that we need to make healthy decisions as a body and as our members gather to vote on these things. And Lord, also will you give us the means and the provision um, and that we, tr- we trust that you will uh, that w- do that which you have called us to do. And so Lord, we look to you to provide, to give strength, to give vision, and to, re- to instill Uh, continued mission and purpose for us. And lastly, Lord, that desire to just grow, not just in the values of Metro, but to grow in all that your kingdom values and desires and what you've called us to do, much of what we're gonna be talking about today. Father, will you instill us and endow on us power and wisdom and clarity and peace, strength to encourage, to move forward in advancing your kingdom as we commit more and more to the city. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, We're going to be closing out the book of Luke today. But we're going to be doing this, ironically, through reading the end of the book of Luke and going into the book of Acts. Why, Why are we doing that? It's because Luke was likely a disciple of the apostle Paul who wrote his account of the gospel. Sure, that's what we've been looking at. But he also wrote the book of Acts. And they kind of go hand in hand because at the end of the book of Luke, in verse 51, uh, Jesus says, the text says that Jesus left them. He left his disciples and he was taken up into heaven. He was taken into heaven. It's what we call the ascension of Jesus. And in Acts chapter 1, which we just read, it begins with the ascension of Jesus. So the book of Acts picks up where the book of Luke ends. At the end of uh, Luke, in chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus says, I'm going to send you what my father promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And at the beginning of Acts chapter 1, in verse 4, Jesus says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. So in both of these cases, Jesus is saying the same thing. Uh, Luke is recounting in many ways the same narrative. Jesus says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the power, wait for the gift. And this is important because it means that the ascension of Jesus is a trigger. It's what they were, uh, the ascension of Jesus is a trigger that releases the power of the gospel, releases the gift over all the world. It's very important we understand this and that we don't uh, not comprehend it, misinterpret it. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, Luke writes, in my former book, he's talking about the gospel, this is Luke, in my formal, former book, uh, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day Jesus was taken up into heaven. So essentially, Jesus starts, I mean, Luke starts by saying, before I showed you all that Jesus did and all that he said before he was taken up to heaven, but that was just the prequel. Now I'm going to show you everything that Jesus did after, everything he began to do afterwards. And it's powerful. He said it's like an explosion to the degree that we're still seeing and experiencing the reverberations of that explosion today. And it's just an equally as powerful what caused it. We're going to look at three things today. The significance of the ascension of Jesus, 
Two, the meaning of that ascension. Lastly, how we apply it. The significance of the ascension of Jesus, the meaning of the ascension of Jesus, and lastly, the application of the ascension of Jesus. It's important because as we just prayed together about, as a church, we're growing, and we, we're in a rare moment in the church in general, a rare renewal moment in our city here in this, in this place. The Lord is doing a lot through Metro, and none of it matters unless you understand this. So first we're going to look at the significance of the ascension of Jesus. Why is it important? Uh, verses 2 to 3, Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he showed himself to his disciples. These were his chosen apostles. They, he showed them convincing proofs that he is alive. And he did this over a period of 40 days teaching about the kingdom, teaching about the kingdom of God. Why did they need convincing proof? It's because some of them doubted. In fact, there are people in this room Probably many of us, skeptical, doubting. And what does Jesus do? Does he say, well, no, you are not invited. You are not welcome. I'm going to discard you, dismiss you. No, he doesn't do that. He actually welcomes it. He's here with us right now. He's giving us his presence. He's giving us his word. He's giving us his teaching. And just like he did back then, what does that mean? If you're trying to see what Christianity is all about, the greatest resource is right here. The greatest resource is hearing God's word, the words of Jesus through the life of the church. The greatest resource is to be able to learn from God's word, to be transformed through God's word. Verse 4 to 5, Jesus tells them, wait in Jerusalem for this promised gift, the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about. He says, it's before you were baptized with water. That's what John the Baptist said. Now you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? On one hand, just like baptism with water, you're going to be cleansed. It's what the Holy Spirit does. He baptizes you. He, he, um, he applies the gospel to his people. But it's, it's more than that. The word baptize also means to dwell. The Holy Spirit is now dwelling in us. And in verse 7 to 8, because you have the Holy Spirit, because he's living in you, because he's dwelling in you, Jesus says you will have power. The power of the Holy Spirit is in you. You are Jesus' witnesses, he says. You are my representatives. What does that mean? Where you go, Jesus goes. Where you are, that's where Jesus is. Whenever you're trying to serve, Jesus is serving. Whenever you're trying to, uh, to uh, bring the word of God to counsel and to comfort, Jesus is bringing the word of God, and he's counseling and he's comforting. You see that? Whenever you're blessing people, Jesus is right there, blessing. But then in verse 9, he ascends to heaven. And in verse 10, the disciples are just watching. They're looking up and they're watching. And then two angels appear in verse 11. They say, why do you stand here looking? Why are you doing this? Why did they do this? See, the apostles, they took Jesus' ascension as his absence. He's leaving us now. They, they took his ascension as this is the absence now of his presence with us. We're not going to be as intimate. We're not going to be as, as uh, close as we used to be. We're, we don't get to experience the intimacy and the leadership and the shepherding presence of Jesus. Now God is going to reside uh, with us at a distance like, what do we do now? That's what they're thinking. So he just kind of stood there. And these angels appeared and they said, look at you. You were living, you were already powerless. You've got powerless lives. You're just watching. You're just stuck. You're gazing to the sky and you're inactive, which means you still don't get Jesus. You still don't get the meaning of his death. You don't get the meaning of his resurrection. You don't get him. But see, at some point here, before they leave this place, they do get it. They get it. And what we're given a snapshot is they are on the brink of getting Jesus. They're on the brink of crossing from that moment where God and Jesus' presence was all just facts and knowledge and they're just living and kind of trying to make sense out of it. And they somehow cross that bridge and now all of a sudden they get it. And what happens is once they get it, once they leave this place, it says in verse 52 of Luke 24, he was taken up to heaven, then they worshiped him. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They stayed continually at the temple praising God. That's the end of the book of Luke. That's the end of the series. And so right here, just before they, they leave to return to Jerusalem, before this explosion of worship, before this explosion of joy, they're just watching Jesus leave them. It's this moment, they're on the brink of that moment when it hits them, the trigger is now going to go off. 
Because the ascension of Jesus doesn't end up being the absence of Jesus. That's the message of the angels. He's not absent from you. He's not distant from you. It's not the absence of Jesus or his intimacy or his leadership or his shepherding, but it becomes the sustained, powerful, intimate presence of Jesus and his intimacy and leadership and shepherding. The ascension of Jesus, it doesn't just release his power. It doesn't just trigger the, the power, the gift that's going to come. It's going to magnify it. It's going to intensify it. It's going to apply it to his people. And unless you have an understanding of what that means, I mean, we confess if you were here last week as we were uh, observing and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we recited an age-old creed called the Apostles' Creed. They didn't put that creed together, and in the creed it says, the, he ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. They didn't just throw those words in there because it sounded cool, you see? You have to really get what that means because if you don't, you will live a powerless life. Some of us, were already living that powerless life. One week past Easter, it's the crash, and now we're just aimlessly just doing the church thing and aimlessly doing the, the life thing, aren't we? And the angels are asking, what are you doing? I mean, they just lost their ultimate love. What can they do? Well, I mean, some of us, we've experienced some great losses. What can you do? Either you're going to let your heart be hardened, and you're, I'm going to buck up, I'm going to stop focusing on losses, I'm going to push through and power through on my own, is that essentially you're going to get tired, and then things anxious and weak, depression's going to hit, sadnesses, or because life doesn't just stop, the sorrows continue, harder stuff happens over time, you see? Or what's going to happen is you're going to experience a greater beauty, and a greater power that softens your heart and sources you with new strength. For the disciples, the ascension of Jesus, it was supposed to be like pulling the plug on their power, but it ended up giving them an even greater power. That's the significance. Now, secondly, what is it then? The Apostle Creed actually really nails it because the ascension of Jesus has a double meaning. You see, when you ascend, you can, it means two things. One, there could be a physical ascension to a higher place. Yes, Jesus Christ physically ascended. They literally saw him uh, being lifted up. But it wasn't just a physical ascension. Luke chapter 24, verse 51, and Acts chapter 1, verse 2, it says that he was taken up to heaven, not to the heavens, not into the clouds. You see, so two, to ascend is more important, more than the Apostles' Creed talking about a physical ascension of Jesus, he's talking about the ascension, the, the rising in a relational way, in a status way, to a higher power, to a higher authority. You think, think about this. When Jesus Christ ascended, he still had a body. He was still a man. What does that mean? He is our perfect representative. He knows us. He understands us. He gets us. You see? Jesus lived a perfect life. He came to the earth to live a perfect life because we couldn't and we didn't. We rejected that. You see? He perfectly obeyed the law of God, which we could not do on our own. We could not fulfill on our own. We are too weak and too powerless. We need power to do that. And then he dined to pay the penalty for all of our sins. And then he rose again and he defeated death. That's the resurrection. And now he's glorified. And when he was ascended, before as a man, he was limited. But now, I mean, at that point, it was, he was only around one place at a time. Now he's on the throne. Now he's on the throne. And he's a king of kings. He has ascended to the highest position of power on, in the universe. And in heaven, and now he can execute, he can apply his will, he can apply his power, he can apply his benefits, the benefits of, God, of the gospel everywhere and anywhere as king, king of the universe. We have a king who knows us, who understands us, who represents us, who sacrificed for us, who loves us. I mean, that's a good king, right? At the resurrection, remember Mary Magdalene? Mary Magdalene didn't even recognize that it was Jesus who was resurrected. He finally, she finally recognizes Jesus. And she tries, the first thing she does is she tries to cling on to him. She tries to hold on to him. And what does Jesus say? Mary, don't hold on to me. Why? I've not yet returned to the Father. That's what he says. I've not yet ascended to the Father. 
You have to understand when Mary died, I mean, when Jesus died, it was like Mary died. Jesus was everything to Mary, particularly Mary because of her status, low status, no status. And, and what Jesus is saying is, so when, when she sees Jesus, she wants to cling to Jesus. It's like, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let you out of my sight this time. And Jesus is saying, Mary, uh, you're afraid to let me go because you're afraid to lose me. But I'm going to ascend to the Father. I'm going to go. And when I do, we can be even more intimate than we've ever been. You will never lose me again. I will be present in every one of your private moments. Every sorrow, every joy, I will be present. I will be there. No matter where you are in life, down or up, suffering or celebrating, I will be present. Here, I'm just in one place at a time. But once I ascend, I will be everywhere that you are. No matter where you are, no matter how you feel, no matter what you're doubting, what you're afraid of, what you're suffering, my presence can be experienced everywhere. And that will give you power. Now, let's make this practical. In verse 11, the angels, they ex they're explaining the meaning of the ascension of Jesus. He says this, they say, this same Jesus that you see leaving are gonna, is coming back just as he left. In other words, r Jesus is now at the right hand of God. So right now, his kingliness, his rule, his power, his authority, that can be applied everywhere and anywhere. He is still king and he will reign forever and he's coming back. You see, the disciples, they knew him. They lived with him. They were intimate with him. Now what the angels are saying is anyone can know him. Anyone can be a disciple. The kingdom is now advancing forcefully. There's a release of the kingdom. Verse 8, how does Jesus, you know, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at verse 6, the disciples ask, will you now establish, will you now restore the kingdom? That's what they've been waiting for. Verse 8, Jesus, how does he respond? You will receive power. You will be my witnesses. So in a sense, uh, the disciples are asking, so are you going to now show yourself to the world? And Jesus is saying, no. You are going to show me to the world. The disciples are asking, well, are you going to now restore things, restore order? And Jesus is saying, no, you are going to begin to restore order. The disciples are asking, okay, so is there going to be justice now? You're going to bring justice to the earth? Jesus is saying, no, you are going to bring justice to this earth. You are going to begin doing this. The disciples are asking, well, so is there going to be peace and, and, and celebration and joy over, over what you've done? Jesus is saying, no, you are going to bring that around the world. You see? So what that means is, right now, because he's ascended, Jesus is present through his people, always. That means what? If God's people are teaching, Jesus is present teaching. If God's people are speaking into you, Jesus is present speaking into you. If God's people are bringing reconciliation between broken families or people, even in the church, Jesus is present doing that reconciling work, reconciling work. If God's people are counseling and comforting, Jesus is present counseling and comforting. If God's people are correcting, disciplining, Jesus is correcting and disciplining. You see that? The church is the visible representation, the visible representative of the presence of Jesus. If the church is present in the city, Jesus is present in the city. If the church is present uh, in the, in, in, among serving people, Jesus is present serving people. If the church is providing and demonstrating acts of incredible generosity, Jesus is the one providing and demonstrating acts of generosity. If the church is working issues of justice, Jesus is present working issues of justice. We are his witnesses. But that also means, that also means when you pray, Jesus is present. When you read the Bible, Jesus is present. When you're obeying God's word, Jesus is present. When you desire to honor God through his word, Jesus is present. When you're serving people out of love, Jesus is serving people out of love. When you're trying to demonstrate love out of your delight in Jesus, Jesus is present demonstrating love. When you are forgiving that, that incredibly impossible act of forgiveness apart from Jesus, but, but when you are able to forgive, Jesus is forgiving. 
when you're sharing the gospel, Jesus is present. You're not changing anybody's hearts. You're not going to change anybody's hearts. The Bible says it's the Holy Spirit who enters in. He regenerates, brings you new life. He's doing all the work that actually matters. Friends, make no mistake. I'm not here. What do you think I do Saturday night? Lord, I pray for this person and that section. Lord, you know, I'm so afraid. Like, I'm so afraid. Look, every word that I say is so important. Make sure every word is just impactful. You think that's what I pray? I just trust that who God will speak to, he will speak to. My job is just to proclaim, and so is yours. Take that to your short-term missions. Take that to your community groups. Take that to the city. Take that to the office. It also means when you're meeting that deadline at work oh, and you're laboring and sweating, maybe stressing, Jesus is present. When you're trying to figure out what's wrong with that formula on that spreadsheet, you know, and you're walking through cell by cell, Jesus is present with you. When you're in the clinic, when you're in the home, Jesus is present. When you're laboring over that paper, Jesus is present. And you are his representative, so are you doing it with integrity as his witness? Are you doing it as a representative of Jesus, as a, as a part of his kingdom? That means that there is a difference and the possibility of honoring God or honoring yourself in the workplace, at home, raising your children, in the church. I mean, think about it. You can, you can serve seemingly selflessly and yet to be fully selfish. You know that in the church. We can do that. It's, it's your, you know, smile and serving and active and yet inwardly wanting approval and wanting the honor and it's for yourself. We know that. It shows up in the way you complain about things and who you complain about, what you complain about, the issues that we have. Is it for God's glory or your glory? God's honor or is it your honor? When you're at home, we complain about our spouses. We complain about our children. We've made it a culture and a habit of doing that. You see it in commercials, the way men and women are denigrated depending on the ads that you watch. Whose honor are you serving? The ascension of Jesus says that there is a difference and a possibility between honoring God and honoring yourself in all places because Jesus is right there with you. And he sees you and he knows you. And he understands. That's the blessing of it is that he also understands. I mean, you talk about being wrongly accused, he understands. You're talking about harshly abused, he understands. You're talking about being oppressed, he understands. And he is the king of kings and submitted himself to that. He understands. Brokenness and blood and tears and, and weeping, sweating and laboring and toiling, looking at it like it's, it's without meaning or purpose, just, en just endless suffering and death. He was there. He knows it. He understands it. And he's saying, you gotta re that's why you got to remember, he's sending you to represent him. How do you apply this? Think about this. <clears throat> the disciples, they betrayed Jesus not too long ago. Now they're his representatives. Jesus forgave them, entrusted them as his representatives to sustain and support his mission. A lot of us in the church, we hear the gospel and you say, I believe but then you've got this powerless life. You know what you're, I mean, you know what you're doing? You're inactive. You're gazing at the sky. It's as if Jesus ascended physically and now that intimacy is gone. It's almost like he has left you. And so you get these kind of snapshot moments where you feel something and that's what you're, you're just gonna live from feeling to feeling? Is that how you're gonna do your thing? The angel's saying, stop. He is now king. He didn't go off to nowhere. He is king and he's ruling and he sees everything and he's with you and he's present and he can be even more intimate with you. That means that that power is present to transform, to shape, to change you into the likeness of Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. You see? 
We tend to stare off and, and we, we see Jesus ascending physically. He's gone, but we don't see him ascended to the throne. And so he just seems distant and life just seems powerless. And it's because, remember, the book of Luke is really about discipleship, following Jesus, what it means to really get him. That means he still don't get him. What the entire book has been about. So we're looking and craving the warmth of a relationship with Jesus without submitting to the words of Jesus. We want the warmth of a relationship with God without obedience to God. We want the thrill of a relationship with God and the thrill of salvation, but we don't see the responsibility of salvation. The responsibility, the submission that comes with salvation to his word, what Jesus said. Here's a question. Are you willing to trust Jesus to the point where you're going to make changes in your life today? Changes in your relationships now. Are you willing to do that? I'm not asking you if you love Jesus. I can't judge whether or not you love Jesus. I'm asking you if you believe him. I'm not asking you if you love Jesus. I'm asking you if you trust him. I'm not asking you if you love, this is not a love question. This is a faith question. Where do you get the power for that? The Bible says, I mean, we can't believe in Jesus on our own will. If you would, you could. If you could, you would have. You couldn't, so you didn't. That's why Jesus came. He came to release the trigger so that we can. Where do you get the power? Before Jesus ascended to the throne, before he ascended to heaven, he first ascended to the cross. He ascended to his death. So in John chapter 12, Jesus, uh, John explains, you know, well, Jesus tells his disciple, when I, am, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He's not talking about the ascension. He's talking about the crucifixion. And John explains it. He says, he said this to show by what kind of death he is going to die. In other words, before Jesus ascended to the throne, he first ascended to the cross. On the cross, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know what he was doing? He was looking out. He was looking up. And he's saying, now you're really distant. God is really absent. Where is the intimacy? Where is the closeness? Where is the leadership and the shepherding comfort of my father? He's lost it. The disciples, they look up, and they're kind of like navel gazing in a sense, and, and the angels are saying, what are you doing? Why are you looking up? You see, Jesus is now more present than he's ever been in your life, and you will have God's presence with you forever. But Jesus Christ, when he looked out on the cross, when he looked up, he saw only distance only absence. He saw the abyss of the emptiness of God. For the apostles, the physical absence of Jesus led to his power, led to their power. Why? Because for Jesus, the forensic absence of, of, uh, of the Father drained him of power, drained him of power on the cross. So what he's saying is, I've lost the presence of God. I've lost the intimacy. I've lost the relationship. I've been emptied of power as a result. I have no power. You get the gift. I've, I, I get the curse, you see? And so he sacrificed his throne, yet do you know, even as he lost power, even as he lost the presence of God, he's saying, I'm ruined. Look at the humility of Jesus here. Never once does he blame God. Never once does he blame his people. Never once is he angry. Look at the confidence of Jesus. He's still trusting the Father. Look at his patience. Look at his poise. Look at his submission. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And he clings to the word of God. Through and through, he's reciting Psalm chapter 22. Did you know that? I mean, of all the Psalms that he could have quoted while he was on the cross, you would think, hey, give me a verse that's going to comfort me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be a one. That's not what he quotes. He quotes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was living out the psalm. He was fulfilling the psalm. And as he was fulfilling the psalm, you know what that means? He was processing his suffering through God's word. Even as he was suffering, the darkest moment of his life, he was processing it through the word of God. Why did he do it? Jesus Christ lost the presence of God so that we would have the presence of God. Jesus Christ lost the intimacy of the Father so that we would have 
intimacy with the Father anywhere and everywhere. Jesus Christ emptied himself of, of power so that we could be gifted with that power. And now Jesus Christ ascends to the right hand of the throne of God so that we could be his witnesses, we could be his representatives. You get that? You were empowered with that. What are the implications? One, how does the presence of Jesus, how does his power strengthen you in real life, in real life circumstances? In, your, in the office, at work, what do you like? I mean, as, as a pastor, I, I'm always curious what you're like in the workplace. What do people say about you? If you were a fly on the wall, what would people say about you? Well, he says he's a Christian, but when something goes wrong, it's all about covering himself first. When he fails, he's great and kind until he fails. Then the complaints begin. Then he spins it. Oh, then she starts to blame people. Oh, she is so driven. She is ruthless. You know what they're saying? They're saying there's no power. She's just like us. He's just like us. And Jesus says, you are my witnesses. They say, oh, I mean, she's just as afraid of losing her job like I am. There's no confidence there. And she's not humble. He's not humble. He is very assertive, very bold, almost to the point of being off-putting. Jesus says, you are my representatives. You know what that means? When you lack integrity, Jesus lacks integrity. When you lack courage, Jesus lacks courage. When you are arrogant, Jesus is arrogant. When you're a jerk, Jesus is a jerk. In the church, when you are self-focused, that turns, you in, that turns it into a self-focused gospel. At home, when you are not serving each other, that turns into a self-serving gospel. That's what your spouse picks up. That's what your kids learn. You get that? The more you see the ascended Jesus on the throne, it brings you down to earth. The gospel makes you winsome because it brings you down to earth. You did nothing to receive the salvation. We are broken because of our sinfulness. And where we go without Jesus, we're just going to be breaking things everywhere in our lives. Can you own that? But the gospel gives you winsome character because there is now a possibility of honoring God. And this isn't just when things are going well. I mean, who can't do that? This isn't when things are going well. This is when you're angry. This is when you are in pain. This is when you are suffering. This is when you've been betrayed. This is when you're experiencing like, like, like suffocating guilt, suffocating loss. When you failed people's expectations or people have failed your expectations, especially when people have failed your expectations. You can have a resilience. You know Why? Because Jesus was resilient, you are resilient. Because Jesus was courageous, you can be courageous. Because Jesus has integrity, you can have integrity. He is ruling at, at the right hand of God. And we are his representatives. He gives us that power. The power is you. we are in, brought into union with him. Two, look at your gifts. I mean, think about all the gifts that we have in this room. All those gifts, we have people who are so intelligent and strategic and creative and incredibly relational. All those opportunities that you are given, who gave those opportunities to you? Jesus said, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, every corner of every office, every corner of every hospital, every, every corner on Wall Street in the finance district. Every corner of the home, every corner of his church, he is present. You are his hands, you are his feet. What are you doing with that? Most of us, we use these gifts to build ourselves when God has called you and endowed these gifts on you to build his kingdom. It's called calling. You are his representatives. The gospel, the only way you do it, the gospel gives you a radical humility. 
because you know he has called you. He has chosen you. Of all the people who are good at that spreadsheet, he chose you to work on that spreadsheet. He chose you to be in that office. Of all the people that he could have chosen, that makes every job important. That makes every job important. Some of you are just so sad about the place where you're in because you made some mistakes, and now it's like, i got to start here. It's so low. It's so bottom. I'm at the bottom, and you're just so discontent and dissatisfied, but God put you there and endowed you with his spirit, his power. And you're just looking at, like, I just want to be somewhere else. I belong, and I deserve to be somewhere else. Yeah, I get it. You made some mistakes, and I get it. You think that you brought yourself down, and, and you did. But Jesus is present now. And that gives you power. You were there with purpose. Say that to Joseph, thrown into a well, into a place just left for dead by his other brothers, betrayed by his own brothers and thrown into a well, left for dead, going back to tell their, their dad that he's dead, sold off into slavery, 13 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, at least 13 years. We don't really know how long. But the thing is, tell that to Joseph, who's at the bottom of the bottom. And yet God used that to bring salvation to the world in his time. A radical humility, that's going to make you meek. That word meek, oftentimes when you see that word meekness in, in the Greek, in the New Testament, it's likened to a horse, powerful horse, a stallion. You see, wild doesn't bring any benefit, often very inefficient because they're not trained. But when you hone that stallion, when you hone that horse, and you raise that horse up, and you give him those blinders so that he's got vision and clarity, all of a sudden, every muscle is being used with intent to win that race. That is meekness. It's not weakness. It's incredible power harnessed by the owner. It's going to give you, you need a radical humility for that, but... You also, the gospel also endows you with confidence. Why? Because what you have is more powerful than anything the world has ever seen, anything the world has ever experienced. That means your words have power to call out sin and be effective because God is present, making it effective to bring clarity, to bring wisdom, to strengthen, to comfort. Without any rejection or fear, we say, oh, I'm, I'm too afraid to talk about the gospel with my friends, as if, like, your words are, have so much meaning, as if that's what's going to change somebody's life. I need to say it a certain way. You've got the script. God is present with you, working through you. If the prophet Jonah can preach the worst sermon known to man in the Old Testament to a very wicked and evil people, and all hundreds of thousands of people are just all prostrate and, and repenting because of that. Surely, God, the gospel doesn't make you more articulate. The gospel assures you of the presence of God going out into the world. And by the way, I'm not just talking about evangelism. I'm talking about in your obedience, with your friends, with your families, in your homes, in the workplace, living as his representative. That's going to give you an incredible confidence. Jesus never said you're going to be more articulate about the gospel. He never said it was dependent on your goodness. You have friends who tell you, well, what right do you, I get it, you just became a Christian. What right do you have to speak into me like this, to say this to me? Look at your life. Your life is a mess. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. That's why I needed to be saved. That's why Jesus saved me. You see, the gospel is not about what you accomplished. It's about what Jesus accomplished. It's not about your merit. It's about Jesus' merit. It's not about your goodness. It's about Jesus' goodness. It's not about your works. It's about Jesus' works. That we don't go and we don't share, uh, to, uh, be, we don't speak with authority because of our goodness. That's not where the power come from, comes from. We speak with authority because it's real, because it's true. Fourthly, because it's true, there's an unshakable poise in the face of suffering, in the face of rejection. In Acts chapter 7, just a few chapters from the passage we just read, Stephen, the martyr, he's about to get stoned to death because he's a Christian. And it's the religious people that are going to stone him. He's got every reason to be afraid. But then he looks up, and you know what he sees? 
He sees Jesus at the right hand of God. He sees the ascension. And that gives him such a radical confidence. You know what he does? He knows he's about to die. His family, his reputation ruined. And yet Jesus as king of the world at the right hand affirming him. That was enough. That was enough. It gave him a radical confidence. In that, in that how does he respond? On one hand, he calls out sin. He calls out injustice. What incredible confidence. And yet he says, I see heaven open. Jesus' presence is so real and so intimate. There was such a deep sense of intimacy there. It was so real. It shaped him. Even in the midst of pending death, it made it inconsequential for him. Lastly, Jesus Christ is now at the right hand of the throne. That's a place of the prime minister. That's the place of the king. That means that he is in control. Have you given and submitted full authority to Jesus And yet because he's a man, because he's a human, he understands you, he knows you, he loves you, he died for you, he rose from the dead dead for you, he defeated death and sin once and for all for you, we know we can be, the gospel assures us this, we we can treasure Jesus because he treasures us and now he rules over everything for you because he ascended. That means that because he's a prophet, every word of counsel that you receive, every challenge from the word of God, every warning from the word of God is for you. We need to listen to the word of God. But secondly, because he's a priest, he became a sacrifice for you. He entered in and and created access for us. So now we can enter into the most holy place. We have that kind of intimacy with God, even more than the high priest did on earth. That's incredible intimacy. We can worship freely. And because he's king, he has authority over you. Everything. Now, we love the priest part. I've got access. There's a lot of warmth there. We don't like the king part, do we? We don't like the submission part, do we? Friends, you can't have one without the other. That means everything that happens is not just for a reason. It's for you. You may not understand why some things are happening, especially when things go bad, but God is doing 10,000 things for his glory and for your good. And his glory and your good are intertwined with his love for you. So if you don't get the cross, if you don't get Jesus, you're not gonna get the ascension of Jesus. And if you don't get the ascension of Jesus, you can't be his representative. You can't be his witness. You will not have power. You will have powerless lives. And so you won't have the humility, you won't have the confidence, you won't have the poise, you won't have the submission to his authority, you will not have power. Do you get the ascension of Jesus? If you don't get the ascension of Jesus, you're going to be oscillating between what? Between working hard, anxiety, and depression, and anger. You're just going to be oscillating between those states because you're trying to ascend on your own. And you're going to be battling God for control over your life for the rest of your life. You're going to do everything. You're going to try to run everything. You're going to try to live life defending yourself, proving yourself, justifying yourself, bringing other people down to justify yourself forever as if God is not present and he is. Jesus has ascended on the throne. You live like that, it's going to kill you. It's going to ruin you. That is the ultimate ruin because one day it's going to burst into the ultimate battle with God. Stop looking as if Jesus is distant from you. He ascended, but he's ascended on the throne for you. And there's power for you. Let's pray. Let's pray as we come to the table. Lord, as we come to the table together to to eat, Lord, I pray that you would bless us and encourage us, renew your people with not only the words of the gospel, but this incredible experience of renewal, uh, the renewal of the covenant. And Father, I pray that we would truly taste and see that you are good and submit ourselves to you again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's not, uh, uh, it's not random that Jesus would call us to the Lord's Supper to give of his body and his blood, uh, to give of the bread and the wine, Uh, What he's basically saying is when you take of the bread and the wine, there is a spiritual union that takes place 
between Jesus' body and his blood and, 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 the, and the bread and wine. There's a spiritual union. So you're not, this isn't the actual body and blood of Jesus. And it's not just symbolic at the same time. There's a spiritual union that takes place. So just like when you eat an incredible meal and you're savoring that meal, you say, I definitely want to go back again. But when you eat that meal and it's useful for you, what happens is it powers you and you have, you have energy and power and strength to be able to do things. You, you can, there's motion in your life. In the same way, Jesus gives us his body and his blood. He gives us uh, the bread and the wine. And he says, you need to take it in so that it can power you by faith. By faith, it powers you. And so the Lord's Supper is something that, is, that we're invited into to one experience the great intimacy of Jesus. So intimate that we're literally taking him in bodily. And so intimate that he is shaping Represent us to become witnesses and representatives of the kingdom. And so before you take this meal, I want you to examine yourself. Do you believe this? Do you trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you? Meaning that he's got full authority over your life? If you profess faith in Jesus and you're baptized in a church that professes faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and if you're in good standing in your local community, if it's that community is not metro, and then take these elements today. But it, look, if you don't believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please refrain. Look, I know some of you, a lot of you may have been baptized as babies. That's not what qualifies you for this. Some of you may have even gone through your classes and done your thing and maybe even got baptized at some age because you were kind of pushed into this and you don't really believe. That's not what qualifies you. What qualifies you ultimately is do you believe? Because the Bible says if you don't believe and still take these elements, you're actually taking on God's judgment on yourself. Some of you are new to the church and you're like, what is this all about? There is an insert, uh, a laminated sheet. There are some prayers there. Read those prayers. Will you just meditate on those words a little bit? The first one, we're gonna pray together as a body. But the second and third one, will you just meditate on the words? I know you're exploring a faith in Jesus. I know you're exploring what it means to be a Christian. I'm asking you to just continue to walk that journey and explore what that means. But refrain from taking the elements until you firmly believe and so that we could baptize you. Now, please don't misunderstand me. What I'm not saying is, if you're saying, I'm a mess, I'm a failure, I've been so distant from God, I have been living as if God has been absent from me, I don't deserve to take this, that's... That, don't withhold the elements from yourself just because of that. That's why we take the elements. That's why we need the elements. Because it is a reminder for us of God's everlasting presence in us that powers us by faith to live in accordance with his word and with where the gospel leads us. You see that? Okay, so please don't mistake that as, oh, I'm a failure, I'm a sinner, I, I can't take this. You need this for that reason. Otherwise, without the gospel, without Jesus and us, we are powerless and helpless, so you need to take him in. All right? This is an opportunity for all of us to fix our eyes on Jesus, to look at the gospel again as we submit to him as our king and as we take him in. The only reason why you would turn it down is you just don't believe it's true. But for those of us who believe, if you don't mind reading that first prayer on top of that page together. Let's read it together in one voice out loud. Lord Jesus, your perfect life, your death, and your resurrection are the source of all blessing in this life and the life to come. As I eat this bread and drink this cup, renew me in the joy and glory of knowing and serving you. I come to this table on the basis of your merit only and not my own. As you have completely and fully offered yourself for me, I now completely and fully offer myself to you as a living sacrifice. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, as we prepare to take this meal as a body, we see our helplessness. We see our powerlessness. We see how defeated we often live because of the depths of our sin. But we believe that Jesus died for our sins and gave us his righteousness. And so we come to the table. We come to you for nourishment, to be filled with more of Jesus. Forgive us empower us to live under uh, the wise, loving, kind authority of our King Jesus. And it's his name we pray, amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, 
And he gave it to his disciples as I now, ministering in his name, give this bread to you. Let's take a moment, take this together, representing that we are renewed uh, by the blood of Jesus, by his body broken, by faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone. Through scripture alone we see this for the glory of God alone. Jesus says, take this, eat this, this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he took the cup And having given thanks, as has been done in his name, he gave it to his disciples. Here at Metro, we we have a very short service. It's over in like an hour and 20, hour, 25 minutes. Let's take a moment. We said some of you are on the brink of that shift from religion and gospel, from powerlessness to power. Take a moment and reflect on what the gospel of Jesus Christ means. For those of you who are new, visiting, new to faith, new to the church, read those prayers, laminated. If that's something that gets you or moves you, come and talk to one of us up in the front afterwards. But for those, for those of us, when you are ready, take of the wine, take of the cup. And after, for those of you who haven't finished, I'll call us back at the end. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Let's take a moment right now. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Let's pray together. Father, as we close this time, we pray that we will live lives submitted to the authority of Jesus, trusting your word, empowered by your spirit, in union with Christ our King. In his name we pray, amen. Let's all stand and sing together.
John chapter 4, she was a promiscuous woman. She became one of the first missionaries in the New Testament. You know that? She went right back to the town that was rejecting her, cast her out, because her life had been transformed by the gospel. The Apostle Paul was a bitter, religious, murderous, proud, and angry person. St. Augustine was a sex addict. John Newton was a slave trader. Once you get who Jesus is, once you get that he is the king, that he's got all authority, that he went to the cross and he had authority over that. He, went, he rose again from the dead, authority over death. Ascension, authority over the world. Hard arts can soften. People who are in bondage to sin are now free. And you can have the presence of Jesus in your life for you. That means you have power for all time. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. All these stories, what's your story? Let's hear the benediction as we, as we leave. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace, friends.